Um, it's actually it was originally made by Silicon um, Graph or no, um, I can't remember SI. Um, now it's um, Skyworks who makes it, but it's it's an I2C programmable any frequency CMOS clock generator, and we're going to start a little bit with the history of um, I want to call it RF oscillators, and uh, and then how we got to this. So the very basic, very first oscillator that came out was an LC tank circuit. And based on the values of the uh, inductor and the capacitor, they found out that they could actually generate a signal that would be at a specific frequency. The problem with it was is that um, over time, that signal would diminish and you would lose it because what would happen is as you would apply power to the to the inductor, it would basically rev up and feed the capacitor, and that as and then once the um, inductor would reach its resonance point, it would stop passing current and voltage, and then the capacitor would drain, which would then in turn charge the uh, inductor. So you would start to get your sine wave, but over time it would either overrun and go go nuts because of entropy or it would slowly diminish so what the next thing was is that they came out with well what we should probably do is take that that tank circuit or that filter feed it into an amplifier and use that to feed back into the filter so that we could get a steady consistent uh, waveform out of it and um, in about I guess it was 1919 or so, the two first um, stable oscillators, RF oscillators, were created by Cole Pitts and Hartley. And if you actually notice, they look almost exactly the same except for the tank circuit at the bottom. Cole Pitts decided that he wanted to use a, a capacitive circuit or divider to divide um, the voltage that was coming out of the amplifier and feed that back into the circuit. Whereas Hartley actually used inductors to, to split the, the power that was coming out of it and feed it back into it. But for a long time, um, those were used um, as the basis of your signal generation for, a, uh, for your ham radio. They were single frequency because it was very little. But then somebody came across, well, we could use crystals because crystals actually um, resonate at a given frequency. And we can tie that in with an LC tank circuit and actually create um, a, a, a circuit that we could vary a little bit by using a um, variable capacitor. So we could actually just skew the crystal's frequency just enough so that we could actually have a range of frequency that we could transmit over. Um, the, the circuit diagram I'm showing here is from uh, the world famous Michigan Mighty Might. And it's a CW transmitter, it's about 500 milliwatts, but um, it, you use a 12 volt input. That actually starts setting up the, the crystal and it amplifies it. And it comes through the second half of the tank circuit and actually um, uses a, um, what I wanna call it, a transformer to actually transmit the RF. Uh, and you can, if a lot of people, they would get, um, a uh, three point, I think zero seven eight megahertz crystal, and put in there, and they could be on eighty meters, or you could get a seven megahertz crystal, and be on forty meters. But every time you wanted to change bands, you actually had to change crystals, and um, which uh, worked great, but it meant that you had to have an investment in crystals. And then about World War II, you know, the military and the radio companies came up with. We really need to come up with a way to synthesize frequency. And they came up with two different methods of frequency synthesis. Uh, direct frequency synthesis, uh, where uh, we use direct analog synthesis, where they're doing frequency multipliers. So they're taking an incoming signal, and they either multiply that signal or divide it or mix it to get the, a product, or they use filters to, to change it. Or they use direct digital synthesis, where they use a microprocessor 
and it uses a program to generate the desired signal output. Uh, if anybody's familiar with the DDS, um, I think it's an AD9850, uh, it actually uh, uses a lookup table, and we'll get into that in a little bit, to actually generate the signal uh, for uh, the outlet, uh, for a, a sine wave. Um, the other method was through indirect frequency s synthesis. So you could either do frequency locked loops, which it just transfers the frequency characteristic from the input signal to the output signal, or you could look at a phase lock loop, which transfers the frequency and the phase characteristics from the input signal to the output signal. And a lot of our radios today that we use are actually based on um, um, on phase lock loops. Um, so and and so a lot of um, what you'll see today will be based on an F, uh, PLL based uh, frequency synthesis. So I kind of wanted to go over. Um, Direct digital synthesis. This is um, a pinout of the AD9833, which is also a, a, um, a DDS chip. And if you look, there's there's a there's basically a crystal that's that comes in. That's your external output uh, for the clock. And then it actually has a program in it um, that will basically give you your output. But you can also program it. Um, through an SPI, uh, it's a serial peripheral interface. And so you can use a computer to say, I want a signal at seven megahertz or at 28 megahertz. Um, and the way it does that is it actually, I'll get over here to the slide. Uh, it uses like a, a lookup table to figure out where the signal needs to be at different points through the 360 degrees of of the signal when it starts out at zero where that should start off with what's the next one and on and on and so what it does is it actually um, uses that reference clock to figure out what am I doing how many points should I be outputting and then based on that it generates a digital signal and then it uses a digital to analog converter to give you a nice sine wave out uh, or you can also use it for square waves sawtooth waves. A lot of the people that have um, frequency generators, or uh, they use a DDS synthesis um, for the signal output. Um, that way you've got a nice uh, steady signal. The problem is, is that you can't go very fast with them, um, and um, they can be kind of expensive uh, as far as the cost of the chips. Uh, for phase lock loop, synthesizers, what they consist of is you've got some type of frequency reference that's coming into it, and then it goes through an error detector, and then through a loop filter, and then a, a variable oscillator to, to actually modify that signal and uh, provide, provide the output. And then it also uses a feedback to help uh, with the error correction. Um, and it can get into, you can do all sorts of different things with them. Um, they're quite, uh, uh, they're used quite a bit. So we're going to kind of talk about what the 5351 is and um, why that's been picked up um, and used quite a bit. Um, so these are links and uh, you'll be able to go out to the groups IO and pull down um, the presentation. Um, the the product details and the um, data sheet. These are links to that. Um, but there are actually three different chips. There's the 5351A, B, and C. The A uses an external crystal and provides up to eight outputs. So you can actually program that chip to give you out eight different signals. Um, most of what we see though in, in the um, the clock jet or the the breakout board we got only outputs three signals. Uh, the B actually gives you out 16 signals and the C does, but they both actually it's different on whether they use just a crystal or whether they use a voltage control oscillator um, to provide that. And and really what it is is it takes that clock input, that crystal input, 
and then goes through its circuitry to generate out what you're looking for based on how you program it. Um, we'll get to, this is kind of the diagram of it. So you see here that you've got um, your XA and XB, that's where your crystal os your crystal's gonna come in. It uses that to drive the oscillator and then the phase locked loops basically go through, provide your clock signal and then how you program it through the I2C interface. Um, the multi-synth will actually generate a signal at whatever frequency you want um, and then output that on clock zero, one, or two. Um, and it's, it's a very simple package. Uh, it's very easy to um, program. Now, why, why do we care about the SI5351? I guess ma mainly it kind of started out in 2014. A lot of people were looking for an easier way to have a more reliable um, variable frequency oscillator. A lot of the crystal oscillators they would be great until they started to get hot and they would tend to drift. So you would get oscillator drift in that. And so people started looking at different ways um, to do this using, you know, a, P a phase lock loop like the 5351 or the DDS chip uh, because it became a more stable with temperature. It, it's, you could program it easily to change frequencies in that. Um, and it was um, much easier to use. So in 2014, EtherKit came out with um, a board that they sold uh, that was like one of the very first uh, 5351 kits for amateur operators. And with that, they actually built out uh, the library for Arduino, which made it very easy for you to program the chip and um, allowed you to basically get a jump up because you could use that in an Arduino and you could basically have three different clocks that you that you could use for your your homebrew rig so not only did you use it for the um, your base frequency oscillator your beat frequency oscillator but you could also use it for your for any other the the um, oscillators that you needed for your um, for your mixers and for your output and then in 2015 Asher Farhan uh, VU2 ESE started using it for the VFO and his BIDX single board HF radio project. Back in 2008, actually I guess even before that, everybody was building these and they were building uh, crystal-based oscillators and, and that was one of the biggest problems they had. So they started using uh, the SI5351 and he actually even built out an entire interface called the Radino, which was a, um, our, um, an Arduino Mini, uh, Pro Mini, a uh, LED display, a um, encoder, and the SI53, and it was all in one contained VFO module that was programmed, and you could basically, you'd have a menu you could go through, pick your different bands, pick your frequency in that. And then um, Pete Giuliano did another one along with Benjamin Kuo, um, uh, that's called Let's Build Something. And it was a radio project and it was, they were basically going through and showing people as like an introduction to building a, a sideband radio. And it was featured in uh, QRP RC's QRP quarterly article series. And then um, I think uh, most people who are familiar with QRP Labs, Hans Summers, back in 2018, uh, came out with his QRP QCX uh, CW uh, kit and he also did a presentation at four days in maine that detailed how he was using the si5351 not only for um, the vfo but also to drive the talo detector um, so that uh, for the receiver side and he's always been looking at ways that he can bring home brewing a uh, radio home brewing into the modern day and he's he's even he everything he does he tries to do incremental uh, improvements on it and this year at uh, four days in May at Hamvention he announced the the QMX which is now a multi-band uh, multi-mode transceiver uh, kit that I think it's about eighty dollars and it basically does right now both CW and uh, 
digital mode. So you can actually plug it directly in. It's got an onboard uh, audio um, uh, system for sound card so that you can plug it into your computer, uh, drive it uh, using cat commands, and um, do uh, FT8, JS8 call, whisper with it, and um, as well as do CW. Um, and he's currently working on a, a sideband uh, upgrade in the firmware. So those are some of the reasons why this is uh, taken, you know, is being used in it. And I should say that, you know, a lot of um, the um, commercial folks are, you know, using it. Like I said, the KX3, the KX2 uses it. Um, I think the TX500 uses it. Uh, I know the new version of the s X, which is a SDR-based uh, uh, kit provided by Aster Farhan, uses it for his clocks. Uh, so it's becoming very prevalent. So it, this series will kind of help you understand how, what they're doing uh, in their firmware, as well as if you're wanting to build it, it'll get you a step up and get you used to it. Some of the resources for this whole section... Uh, if you want to learn about oscillators and synthesizers in great detail, you can check out the ARRL Handbook, Chapter 9. Um, they go through all this. Uh, I've got links to uh, two really good articles on uh, direct digital synthesis and uh, PLL fundamentals out at Analog Devices. Uh, you'll be able to find the uh, product details for all Skyworks uh, chips. They, they have more than just the S5351. They have stuff that will go f higher. I think the, the limits on the 5351 is about 140 megahertz. But if you need something to get in the gigahertz range, they have, they have um, uh, systems there. Um, and then um, so if you want to learn about um, the history and go through some of these other projects, you can check out the HF Signals website. Um, and then uh, the Let's Build Something uh, a blog post from uh, Pete Giuliano out at Jess Systems. Um, and then there's links to um, Hans, Hans's uh, stuff at, from Hamvention uh, 2018, and then uh, the stuff around his, uh, his QMX multiband transceiver kit. Uh, they got links to both his presentations and his. He did very extensive um, uh, papers for the Fort Days of May uh, around what he was what he was looking at, what his mind thought was, and how he overcame the issues that he was that he ran into. And then also the link to the uh, the Arduino library, which we'll we'll get to that probably in the next session when we look at programming um, the um, the fifty three fifty one. 